Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am happy to introduce uh, my MD PhD student, uh, Judd Cahoon. Um, before I do that, I'd like to share one observation or a couple of observations on the track of research productivity in the United States. So when you look at the last 40 years, NIH funding in billions of dollars has gone from about $1 billion to $30 billion from 1970 to 2010. In that same period of time, <coughs> the number of drug approvals per research dollar has plummeted. Now that's multifactorial and all of us are familiar with the various issues with the FDA as well as, of course, increasing complexity of uh, research. But I think a key element in why this has occurred is um, not just failures on the part of m Big Pharma or the FDA, but also the decreasing proportion of research that's done by physicians. Um, in the last uh, 40 years, the, the proportion of NIH grants that uh, is uh, pursued by MD researchers has declined from about half or slight majority to less than a quarter. And um, that itself is multifactorial, but what that leads to, I think, is um, a big problem in translational research that leads to that valley of death that we've all talked about. So I think it's asking, <coughs> if your percent grants were MD, or I should say your total grant money for MD, do you end up seeing that price difference between the Right, grants? absolutely, indeed. So um, I, I think uh, we as a profession have failed in encouraging our young people to pursue research-oriented careers. And um, with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, someone who I think will be a rising star in the field of ophthalmology and visual science. Um, Judd Cahoon is a fourth year student now, so he's finished his two years of, uh, first two years of medical school and is now in his second year in his lab. And, um, he is an investigator who shows a passion for discovery and diligence and dedication. Uh, it's a very unique uh, set of traits that I deeply admire him for, and I'm happy that he's uh, able to share some of his really exciting work in uh, diabetic retinopathy, which will make an impact for <coughs> years to come. Thank you for that introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I'd um, like to uh, pull up the presentation here. Um, just a sec. we get this started. Um, hopefully this, this presentation I'm about to give is it's not meant to be distracting or, or um, motion sickness inducing, but it is supposed to uh, give you a broad overview of the picture so that we're always going to come back and try to see the big picture of what we're about to present here. And with that, it looks like we're ready to go. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak, and I'm very excited to present a little bit of our research which the focus of is stabilizing the vasculature in diabetic retinopathy and measuring the outcomes of retinal function that come from that. So for a broad overview of the talk, <coughs> we'll give a little bit of background into diabetic retinopathy, um, of which I'm sure most of you are very familiar. We'll talk about the model that we use in the lab to mimic diabetic retinopathy, uh, kind of the, the positive and negative side of that. We'll uh, explain briefly about the experimental design and how we're going to uh, um, intervene here, as well as two key results. The two key results will be looking at the vascular structure and function, as well as the retinal structure and function. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk a, a bit about the future directions. So we can get going with that. As an introduction, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness uh, worldwide in the working age population. Uh, this includes about 93 million people worldwide who have some form of diabetic retinopathy. 
The direct medical costs in treating diabetic retinopathy are a half a billion dollars a year in the U.S. alone. Now, if you factor in indirect medical costs for this, it's 35 times that amount because uh, due to the young age at diagnosis. This is happening in the working age population. 35% um, of the people with diabetes in their lifetime will experience some form of diabetic retinopathy. Um, and those numbers, uh, the numbers of people with diabetes are expected to triple by 2030. So this will be of increasing importance um, as we get more well-fed in our society. Two of the key issues I'd like to address in diabetic retinopathy are the hyperpermeability and the ischemia, the vascular leakage, and then the poor perfusion that leads to ischemic retinal tissue that occurs in diabetic retinopathy. Um, in the proliferative form of diabetic retinopathy, there's an ischemia-induced angiogenesis. Blood vessels start to grow. And those blood vessels are not uh, stable. They're not mature, so they leak. Um, a non-proliferative form of diabetic retinopathy leads to edema, specifically macular edema. So just uh, to quickly refresh everybody's mind, we've got some fundus pics here of a nice normal retina with the vessels coming out of the optic disc surrounding the macula there. Uh, in the early stages of uh, diabetic retinopathy, the uh, hallmark that occurs is, is hyperpermeability. And here we can see some uh, exudates that have leaked from the vasculature into the retina, lipid deposits and some macular edema, indicating that there is a, a leaky or a hyperpermeable state in the vasculature. Uh, should the hyperpermeability and improper perfusion uh, persist for a while, this can lead to neovascularization with uh, fragile vessels that can easily hemorrhage. I'm sure you recognize the spots of laser photocoagulation uh, in the background there, which is currently uh, the standard of care for diabetic retinopathy. Should those vessels start to grow out and even attach to the vitreous, they can pull the retina away uh, from the RPE leading to retinal traction, um, which would definitely be bad for vision. Uh, another way to assess retinal hyperpermeability is with fluorescein angiography. Here you can demonstrate the leakiness of the fluorescein from the vessels, um, as well as image some macular ischemia. So if I've said anything here, it's hopefully that diabetic retinopathy, two of the elements are hyperpermeability and ischemia. Great. So there's the background on it. Let's look at the model that we're using in the lab to mimic this. So we're using the uh, Akita mouse model. Now the Akita mouse has a mutation in the insulin 2 gene. It's a heterozygote for this because the homozygotes are uh, embryonic lethal. But that mutation in the insulin gene causes insulin to build up inside the pancreatic beta cells, eventually causing beta cell dysfunction. The mouse can't secrete insulin, resulting in hyperglycemia. Um, and then specific to the retina, some of the things that are seen in this mouse are capillary and pericyte loss, just as they are in the humans. Increased retinal permeability, and that permeability is leading to the macular edema in, in patients, as well as ganglion cell loss. Um, to look a little closer here, what this is, is a trypsin digest. So we've taken the retina either from a patient or from a mouse and uh, digested away all the neural tissue, leaving only the vascular tissue behind. Um, here in our non-diabetic form, you can see these uh, black dots that appear as nuclei just outside of the vessel. Those are the supporting pericytes, which surround the endothelium, offering trophic signals as well as structural support. In diabetes, you lose pericytes, which in turn you start to lose uh, capillaries. With the capillary dropout, you're no longer perfusing the tissue surrounding that capillary, and that can lead to ischemia. Um, the same thing is found um, in mice here, where you have a capillary dropout and pericyte loss, showing that this is a model of early form or early stage uh, diabetic retinopathy. So here's our model. In, uh, this is a cross section through a capillary. So we have the lumen of the blood vessel in here. We've got two endothelial cells connected on the outside, and then a supporting pericyte, that perivascular support cell. The perivascular support cell, the pericyte, secretes angiopoietin-1. Angiopoietin is a, a poetic growth factor, a, a growth factor, a, ma a vascular maturing um, growth factor, much like thrombopoietin is for thrombocytes or erythropoietin is for erythrocytes. Angiopoietin works on the blood vessels. Angiopoietin-1 acts on the TI2 receptor. The TI2 receptor does a number of jobs on the endothelial cell, but one of the things that it does is to stimulate uh, VE cadherin stability in the membrane. 
VEK adherin is that structural support in the adherence junction that prevents leakage and permeability uh, in between the endothelial cells. So really only two things I want you to remember from this slide. Number one, angiopoietin signals to support, uh, to promote VEK adherin stabilization. Now in diabetes, the first thing that is noticed is you have pericyte dropout. And it's hypothesized that the loss of pericytes due to hyperglycemia leads to a decrease in angiopoietin-1 signaling. Without the angiopoietin-1 signaling, the VEK adherin, that stabilizing adherence junction protein, is internalized. That leads to hyperpermeability and macular edema. After a while, without any pericytes, you start to lose the endothelial cells and you get the capillary dropout. There you're going to have poor perfusion, which will lead to ischemia, increased vascular endothelial growth factor, and after a, a long duration, certain patients will develop retinal neovascularization. There's the general microvascular um, pathology that occurs in diabetes. So what's our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that endothelial stabilization with compang one a modified form of that angiopoietin-1, which I'll describe in a minute, will mitigate the effects of diabetes in the murine model. To illustrate this point, we see the same graphs or the same figures as we do before. Loss of angiopoietin-1 can lead to VE adherent internalization, loss of endothelial barrier integrity, macular edema or leakage. And what we hope to do is even in the in spite of pericyte loss or try to supply angiopoietin-1, uh, which the pericytes normally supply. To do that, we're providing long-term expression of compang one which will activate the TI2 receptor and, and in spite of the hyperglycemia, promote VE adherence stabilization and reduce the ischemia in the retina. That's our hypothesis of what we can do. So let's look at the design of the experiment to show how we are inducing compang one expression over the long term. First off, what is Compang-1? Goyang Ko's group at the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology developed a novel form of angiopoietin-1. Here we see full-length ang-1, or a schematic here of native ang-1. And a problem with native ang-1 is that it has N-terminal superclustering, which brings angiopoietin-1 together, but it quickly falls out of solution and it's not very soluble. That's a problem for using it as a therapeutic. So they derived cartilage oligomatrix protein ang-1. All I want you to remember about that is it increases its solubility, makes it more potent and more stable. So we're dealing with an ANG1 variant that still signals the TI2 receptor, but it can do so with uh, increasing concentrations. To deliver it comp ANG1 into the mouse retina, we utilized an adeno-associated virus, serotype 2. Now these AAVs, or adeno-associated viruses, are used currently in clinical trials uh, for uh, retinitis pigmentosa, or AMD. So they are a, a viable viral vector that can induce long-term expression of your protein of interest. Our basic setup was to take a mouse, either a normal mouse, a non-diabetic mouse, in our case the C57 uh, black mouse, which is the background for these diabetic Akita mice, which I described. At two months, we'd give them one intravitreous injection. That intravitreous injection would contain a control buffer, PBS, a viral vector encoding a, a green fluorescent protein as control, or the viral vector encoding our protein of interest, compang one Over the next four months, we would take in vivo retinal assessments of these mice. Some of those in vivo retinal assessments include visual acuity tests, ERGs, optical coherence tomographies, similar things to what we do in patients. And our endpoint of six months, we would assess the permeability of the vasculature in the retina, take cross sections to look for morphology of it, uh, assay protein RNA content, and, and try to get some mechanistic data out of that. So the first question you have to ask is, does this work? Can we induce long-term expression of a protein of interest in the mouse retina? If you remember, our control vector was a, a viral vector encoding GFP. And we get GFP expression from a single intravitreous injection of AAV2 encoding GFP, which starts at about one week post-injection. This is a view from the spectralis looking at the mouse retina, and we can see that there is GFP expression in all quadrants of the retina that increases two weeks and persists through six months. An ex vivo flat mount, the retina was uh, taken out and laid flat on a glass slide and also analyzed for GFP content showing that that one intravitreous injection uh, had viral expression over all of the retina 
And mainly, the virus is, is in the ganglion cell layer. Here we have a cross-section from the choroid, outer segment layer, outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, and the ganglion cell layer. And mainly, the, viral, the virus and its protein expression were limited to that ganglion cell layer. So that's all well and good for GFP. Uh, we also confirmed that COMPANG1 was expressed in the retina. Here we have uh, RT-PCR, just checking for mRNA to make sure that the transcript is being uh, produced. And only in our diabetic mouse treated with our viral vector expressing COMPANG1 did we see COMPANG1, which was good, confirming that we get RNA expression, as well as protein expression. Using an IP and a Western blot, we were able to pull out um, COMPANG1 from the mouse retina, and only the mouse retina um, treated with our protein of interest. Okay, so there's the background that we were able to get uh, expression in the mouse of what we were hoping to get. Now let's see if it had any effects. We'll look at the vascular effects before we look at the retinal effects. So we'll look both for structure and function of the vasculature. Um, taking out the retina uh, at the end of our six-month study and doing a stain for retinal vasculature, either with isolectin, which is shown in green, which stains endothelial cells, or alpha-SMA, which stains smooth muscle, which is found in the smooth muscle cells surrounding the endothelium as well as the pericytes. Um, we'll blow this up a little bit more so you can see what's going on. You can see a nice, beautiful retinal vascular architecture here in our control non-diabetic mouse. Uh, we can see two arteries coming out and a big vein leading back in there. What happens in our diabetic mice is that their retinal vasculature starts to disappear. Pericyte loss, endothelial loss, you can see this on a global scale as we have decreased staining indicating decreased endothelial production as well as decreased pericytes. In both of our control, PBS and GFP treated mice, there was a decrease uh, in the retinal vasculature that was prevented in our COMPANG1 treated mice. If we can appreciate the retinal vasculature of this mouse, even though it is diabetic, looks similar to our non-diabetic mouse. Um, just zooming in a little bit farther and uh, uh, checking this out, you can see some red staining here for uh, pericytes and smooth muscle cells. A loss of pericyte staining, an example of that here in our diabetic mouse. Loss of capillaries, as we can see there's not a lot of uh, connections going on here and a preservation of some of the capillary bed in our compang one treated diabetic mice. This is just one example, and we quantified this uh, with image J analysis to look for total endothelial staining over the entire vascular area. Here are non-diabetic mouse showing about a 24-23% uh, coverage of the endothelium, just a, our estimate of that, is decreased in our two cases of, of control-treated diabetic mice but is preserved in our compang one treated diabetic mice. We're preserving the vascular endothelial area. However, this is a pericyte coverage um, representation here. The treatment with compang one did not preserve the pericyte coverage in our diabetic mice, which is interesting. We were still able to maintain endothelial coverage despite persistent pericyte loss. This is interesting because most patients who present with diabetic retinopathy have already undergone the early stages, have already experienced some sort of pericyte loss, as is the case even with our treated mice. Let's look at some functional data to see if that change in morphology actually has any ramifications in the function of the vasculature in the retina. We'll look at an in vitro study using human microvascular endothelial cells in a cell dish and an in vivo study. First, how do you assay endothelial function outside the mouse? We're using something called transepithelial resistance, which is just a way to measure the amount of barrier integrity or resistance that uh, a monolayer of cells will offer to a small current. So a gold electrode is, is um, placed at the bottom of the cell culture dish. A small current is passed through that, not enough to disturb the cells, and cells are plated on top of that electrode. Now as the cells increase their barrier integrity and increase those adherence junctions, they, in, they uh, offer increased resistance to the current passing through and we can measure that. That'll look something like this. Without any cells plated, you have very low impedance and also very low resistance. As the cells are plated and they grow and form a monolayer, there's an increase in the resistance. 
and then we can add um, an agonist or, or something to increase barrier integrity and we should see a, a jump in that. And that is exactly what we saw here. We have four groups of treated cells. These are human, retinal, microvascular, endothelial cells. And here we plate them, watch them grow to confluence, and once they reach their plateau point, we administer our treatments. In this case, we administered Pompang 1, hoping to see an increase in resistance. PBS is our control to see the normal course of these endothelial cells, or VEGF. Uh, to increase vascular permeability and decrease resistance. Sure enough, in our in vitro assay of barrier function, um, Compange 1 increased the resistance capacity, increased the transepithelial resistance of our endothelial cells compared to the normal course of PBS, and VEGF decreased the resistance. Interestingly enough, in this experiment, Compange 1 did not rescue VEGF induced permeability increases. And we'll get back to why that's important as we look at what happens inside the mouse. So there's an in vitro assay confirming that Compang 1 has functional capacity, that it is activating barrier integrity in the endothelial cells. And next we'd like to look at an in vivo um, model of this. And this is done with the Evans blue dye technique. You take a blue dye, inject it in the tail vein, it binds to albumin, and wherever the vasculature is more permeable, the blue dye will leak. Here you can see nice blue paws, blue nose, a blue ear, but what you shouldn't see are blue retina or blue brain or places where the blood retinal barrier or blood brain barrier should be nice and intact. You shouldn't see a lot of blue in the retina. After injection of the Evans blue dye into the tail vein and your mouse gets nice and blue, you simply harvest the retina, leach the dye from the retina and measure the amount of dye that was present. Here's our non-diabetic mouse and we can see a over three-fold increase in our diabetic mice in terms of blue dye leakage in the retina, indicating retinal vasal permeability. Compange 1 prevented that increase in retinal vasal permeability back to control levels, which was pretty cool because it's showing that not only do we have structural changes, we have actual functional changes in the vasculature as well. What could be mediating these things? As you remember, I asked you to remember just uh, about angiopoietin 1 and VE cadherin. VE cadherin is that adherence junction protein that stabilizes endothelial cells. And in vitro here, using human retinal microvascular endothelial cells in a culture dish, we can see that Compang 1 treatment increases VE cadherin um, stability uh, protein-wise. This also happens in vivo. In our mouse model, we have our control non-diabetic mouse here versus our three diabetic mice and our AAV2, so our viral vector expressing Compang 1, increases VE cadherin stability in the mouse. This could be the, the way it's mediating the increase in barrier function. Now interestingly enough, we looked for VEGF levels, whole VEGF levels in the retina, and found that uh, in our C57 mice, compared to our diabetic mice, we had an increase in VEGF levels, and that increase in VEGF levels was, was prevented with Compang 1 treatment. This represents another mechanism by which Compang 1 can be preventing vasopermeability and stabilizing the vasculature. Not only is it stabilizing VE cadherin, that integral membrane adherence junction protein, but it's also decreasing VEGF secretion or retinal secretion of VEGF. With decreased VEGF secretion, there's another factor for vascular stability, decreasing the permeability inducing effects of VEGF. And that kind of ties in with our ESIS results from that um, barrier assay uh, that we saw here, wherein VEGF didn't, uh, Compang 1 didn't produce VEGF, didn't prevent VEGF induced permeability. Okay, that's all well and good that we've shown we can change the vasculature. But if you can change the vasculature structure and function without affecting the retina, it doesn't really matter. So we looked at the same, um, same points here for the retina. We'll look at retinal structure and then retinal function. Looking at retinal structure, uh, we can use optical coherence tomography, or OCT, on our spectralis, and we can pinpoint um, areas certain, uh, certain distances away from the optic nerve and measure the retinal thickness or the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, as is demonstrated here, in a nice concentric circle. So what this is, this is a cylinder that's been laid out and we're just looking at the, the cross section of the retina all throughout here. <coughs> As we look, we can see that Compang 1 prevents the retinal thinning that occurs in diabetic mice. 
Now here's where mice and men differ in one aspect, is that diabetic macular edema can lead to retinal swelling in patients, but in mice, there is no macula, and they do get retinal thinning. Well, this retinal thinning is not unique to mice, that um, patients can have ganglion cell layer loss due to ischemia and um, um, diabetic retinopathy. So the ganglion cell layer loss that is present in patients is also uh, represented here in our diabetic mice. So overall retina, we have a thinning of the retina in our two diabetic control treated mice, which is prevented with Compang 1. Though the difference wasn't great, it was statistically significant. To focus um, in a little bit more and see which areas of the retina were changing, specifically to look at the ganglion cell layer to see if that was changing as well, we took cross sections and stained them. DAPI, a nuclei stain is in blue, VE, CAD herein is in red. Here's our C57 mouse retina, there's the photoreceptor layer, the um, bipolar cell layer, and the ganglion cell layer. And you can see a nice thick ganglion cell layer here that disappears in this diabetic mouse treated with PBS, and this diabetic mouse treated with control viral vector, but is preserved better in this compound one treated mouse despite his diabetes. Let's look a little closer at the actual ganglion cell layers. We can see um, ganglion cell layers from a non-diabetic mouse, uh, lots of ganglia, lots of uh, nuclei in the ganglion cell layer, decreased nuclei in the ganglion cell layer in our diabetic mice, and pr preservation of those uh, nuclei of the ganglion cell layer in our compound one treated mice. We quantified those results and did show statistical significance um, between our control non-diabetic mouse, our two control treated diabetic mouse, mice, and preservation of the ganglion cell nuclei in our compound one treated mice. So we are preserving some of those ganglion cells, as well as the thickness associated with those ganglion cells. We're currently doing uh, estimates now on the retinal um, nerve fiber layer to determine if that thickness um, is responsible for the preservation of whole retinal thickness. So the take home points from that are we were able to alter the retinal structure. Now, how does that relate to function? We did two assays of retinal function, one being electroretinography or the ERG, and mice, uh, just like humans, were, were um, um, given a full flash ERG at increasing intensities, and here is a representative ERG trace at, at uh, a lower intensity light flash. You can see our compound one, or our, our control C57 mice, those are the, the black layer up here, have a nice um, B wave amplitude. And that's uh, the, the measure we used to quantify each, each ERG was the B wave amplitude. That our two control treated diabetic mice have a lower amplitude here. You can see those, um, those waves are a little bit different than our, C50, our control wave. And the compound one prevented that decrease and looks closer to the uh, control mouse. Quantification of this, looking at B wave amplitude, shows you have um, kind of two groups of mice. You have our diabetic mice down here with lower amplitudes, either treated with PBS or GFP, our controlled diabetic mice. In black, you have our C57, our normal non-diabetic mouse, and our diabetic mouse treated with Compang 1, showing amplitudes in ERG waves similar to that of our control mouse. So retinal electrical function is intact. Now let's look at visual acuity in a mouse. You can't just hold up a Snellen chart and ask them which one is better, so you test their their kinetic tracking response. And the way that you do this, um, as was recently described by Pearson in a Nature paper that just came out, is to place a mouse inside of a box and have these screens that go all the way around. And these screens are gonna show uh, bars of black and white of increasing frequency and um, thinness there. What the mouse will do is it passes in front of it, it will track it automatically, the optomotor response. By um, increasing the frequency of these bars, we can determine a visual spatial frequency threshold, or the threshold at which the mouse stops responding. That correlates to the mouse visual acuity. Just to give you an idea of what we're actually looking at, we have a little video here of, of optometry measuring visual acuity in a mouse. Here's a C57 mouse, and these red bars are just superimposed, but you can see its head start to track where those red bars went. Here's an Akita mouse, not offering much in any sort of tracking response. You can see the bars spinning around it look like this, but this mouse doesn't seem to notice um, or maybe care. Here's another mouse. This is a diabetic mouse treated with PBS, offering poor tracking responses once again, maybe a little bit there as it follows, 
And here's our compang one treated map. So you can see that nose following and tracking along. So that's when the, uh, when the person doing the experiment would say, yes, he's tracking versus no, he's not. Now, after many, many hours of doing this, we were able to show that the frequency threshold of the optomotor response is about 0.35 um, cycles per degree in our non-diabetic control mouse. This spatial frequency threshold, or visual acuity analog, decreases in our two diabetic mice. Compang-1 prevents that decrease. So Compang-1 is not only preserving the retinal structure, but it's preserving retinal function as assayed by ERG and our measure of visual acuity in the optometry. All right. <clears throat> We've reached the end of, of some of the data, and I'd just like to talk a tiny bit about the future directions where we'd like to go. We would like to determine um, whether Compang-1 promotes better blood flow in diabetic versus control mice. And how do you assay blood flow? Well, the retina is awesome because you get to see vasculature and neuronal cells in vivo. So one way we're going to take advantage of that is through something called leucography. And if I can, I'll just show you a couple quick videos. Okay, so what we've done here is we've injected the tail vein with a dye that selectively stains, stains the nuclei but is permeable to white blood cells. And you can see white blood cell transit through the capillaries and then as it jumps back in here, you can see it traveling down the, uh, the vein here. We're able to follow those white blood cells as they pass through their capillaries, measure their transit time, and then also observe any leukocyte adhesion or rolling leukocytes that go around here. In diabetes, there's an increase in, um, in rolling leukocytes and leukocyte adhesion, so this will offer us a, an avenue to see if our treatments are preventing that at all. And then just one, one more. If we come here, you can actually see a leukocyte start to roll down. There he is right there. And he's adhering to the vein as he starts slowly traversing down. We're working on ways to quantify this to show us this is from a diabetic mouse uh, so that we can be able to quantify retinal blood flow that occurs in diabetes. Another mouse we're currently working with, um, as we all know, type 1 diabetes only accounts for a small fraction, 5% of all diabetes in the patient population which is what the Akita mouse in, is an example of, a type 1 diabetic mouse. We're using another mouse. Uh, this mouse has a gene mutation in its satiety receptor. It doesn't know when it's full, the leptin receptor knockout mouse. And it keeps eating and keeps eating and keeps eating, not unlike many people. <laughs> and it, it can be uh, up to three times the size of a normal mouse. It exhibits the full suite of the metabolic syndrome. It has hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, as well as we've started to observe some of the same uh, retinal, microvascular, and functional defects. Finally, we'd also like to look at actual hypoxia levels in the retina, measuring the oxygen tension and saturation of the retina. We looked at VEGF levels, which are a good marker of uh, oxygen tension in the retina, as well as uh, early studies looking at HIF-1-alpha, one of the transcription factors that leads to VEGF production, and shown that that is increased in the diabetic retina. We're also looking for other measures of that. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who've made this work possible, namely um, from the Krizai lab. Peter's been an, a huge help showing me the optometry, as well as the uh, ERG and some of those functional studies of mouse vision. From Dean Lee's lab, Chris Gibson showed us how to do some of the ESIS, or those in vitro barrier function assays, as well as all the people in the neuroscience program, the T32 training grant that supported me for a year, uh, as well as my committee members who've been very patient and understanding and helping me work through this uh, phase of my training. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the um, Body Lab, uh, specifically Hero, for helping get this project started, for being there for any scientific question that anyone might have and knowing the exact right answer and the exact thing to do to get the project moving. He's been a very big help in that. Uh, Tad Mia, uh, excellent lab tech and future medical student who's done wonderful job imaging, helping out with the leucography. Specifically, uh, Paul Olson and Vi, who've done amazing work on helping with the optometry. 
and Courtney Walker, an exceptional undergrad who's helped a lot with the in vitro stuff. So thank you very much. Uh, we invite any sort of input you might have on modulation of VEGF or other mechanisms, pathways to explore, and I'll take any questions. talking about at this time is that they're going to probably require in-process injections. So then you get critical uh, elements about, about how long do you think that uh, each injection results in the, uh, in the early chance of clicking them? Is it something that really could be injected in the first month, year, even longer just to kind of think theoretically about what this might mean in terms of therapy? Because they're obviously doing this with the block, but they have really dramatically changed that whole great thing about this AAV is it is a long-term expression test. So what are we so talking about? Are we talking years? So far, in, in our model, in an in vitreous injection, we've gone out to 10 months and still seen um, the same GFT fluorescence, protein expression is pretty without good. Without drop-off. Without any drop-off, so which is pretty good. So in a single injection, it could be years. Yeah, in some clinical trials, they use the same vector for Parkinson's trials right. and to administer dopamine, and I believe those have gone out in, in terms of years. Right. And so if, if you know, anything better than, than six months. If you're not doing a monthly injection, it's probably an improvement. Um, oh, you're, you're gonna improve. And so we're saying at, at least six months for this study. We've seen expression for 10 months, and I, I'm guessing it'll, it'll continue for, for years. So, so also thinking about one, one of the critical reasons why these kinds of projects never take off, never go through the Boston expense of trying to get approval is that what kind of IP this I've sat through uh, just a few conferences and, and started to barely learn about that sort of stuff. So we have thought about it. But I think about it now. Just the point yeah. I'm making is, is that usually people are excited and they think about it. And it's one of the big issues and reasons why we got all these episodes is that, is that there's so much scattered around so many different areas mm -hmm. that uh, something is just there. They're not just going to get it all open. Nanotechnology really is blessed with truth because of IP. That's something that thinking about more and yeah, I think we have started to see that. Yeah, very exciting. Very Thank you. Yeah, um, or there, there have been some attempts at uh, using modified um, modified AMP1 but in terms of small molecules to stimulate the Chi3 receptor. Um, I, I, I don't know how long you can get that expression, that activation of the receptor if you're using a small molecule. So I don't know what types of small molecule approaches have been used so far. And we went with the bio just to gain long-term expression.
That's a, that's a, a good question. And so we are not saving the Perry site. Um, and we're only providing one of the factors that the Perry sites provide. Uh, in addition to providing ANS-1, they, they're probably unidentified factors in addition to the structural support. So we haven't looked at our studies out long enough um, or we haven't looked in the right areas to see if there is something missing because the Perry sites are still missing. Um, and so Perry site preservation itself has been related to hyperglycemia. So probably the best way to prevent all of this, obviously, is to prevent the hyperglycemia. We would keep the parasites around. It's not as easy as it sounds, which is why we're looking at this pathway. But, but that brings up an interesting point to see what kind of deficits still remain uh, due to lack of parasites. And, and I don't know all the answers to that yet. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of the same microvascular pathologies that occur in the retina are occurring in, in glomerulus as well. Um, our treatment, uh, at least when I've looked for um, GFP expression to see if this viral vector is getting out systemically and, and infecting other areas, I haven't been able to see it outside of the eye. It seems pretty well contained to stay inside the eye, specifically the retina. Um, but it would be interesting, and I know there are other groups that are looking at angiopoietin signaling in the kidney and showing um, better working kidneys after that. We haven't looked at that, but there are studies out there that do show uh, better kidney function. Thank you. Thank you very much.